Justice Lloyd Carmeyer, thank you for joining us again on the All Night Channel. It's my pleasure to be here again. Harry. You and I first did our first conversation. We were just reminiscing a little bit when you were a candidate for the court around 2004, and we always appreciate you taking the time. And I want to say to uh, just the audience, when we interview someone who is a justice on the court, uh, I, I think a it's valuable, uh, especially when we talk about some of the procedural aspects. But there's also sometimes uh, I may inadvertently ask a question that you feel you can't answer, and if you can't, you can't, and uh, we'll we'll just take that into consideration that that's an area that you can't go into. Yeah, I so, appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> as we sit here, you have been the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court for three years, uh, just coming up on three years, which is the term of office. Uh, unlike the U.S. Supreme Court, the justices uh, serve a term. As you look back uh, over your last three years, uh, whatever goals you had set for yourself, how did those come out? What were your goals and what did you feel you've been able to achieve? Uh, my recollection, as I said at the outset, because many uh, chief justices have a, an agenda or have some particular uh, program uh, that they want to espouse. Uh, Justice Thomas was Commissioner on Professionalism. Justice Kilbride was uh, access to justice. Justice Garman, I think, changed the uh, certain things with the access to justice and judicial college. And I just said, I want to make sure we get those programs uh, brought to fruition um, and that we kept the court um, being respected in how we uh, conduct ourselves and how we uh, do the cases. As it turns out, uh, quite a few things happened during my three-year tenure that I can uh, attribute not to my own self, but to the workings of the administrative office and my colleagues. And uh, during our con and, and so I've been very pleased of, of what's, what's happened and where the court is right now. Um, one of the major things in undertaking was restructuring the judicial conference. There was a time when I came on the court that the judicial conference, when we met, all of the judges in Illinois were part of the conference. And then at one point it was all the circuit judges, I believe. Um, it was hard to get anything done with that many people getting together at a meeting. During Justice Kilbride's tenure, uh, that was uh, paired to about 80-some people. We decided to take a completely different look at how to do this and to create a committee that would study what's important to the court, directions we should go, making sure we serve um, litigants, especially self-represented litigants. So our judicial con uh, conference has been reconstituted to uh, 29 people, 15 of whom are judges, and for the first time we have people who are not judges. Some lawyers, some who are not lawyers, but people who are intimately involved with the court system, circuit clerks, trial court administrators, um, lawyers who practice regularly before the appellate or Supreme Court. What is the point of the conference? The Constitution says the, the, uh, judicial the, the court shall convene a judicial conference to, to study the work of the court and to make recommendations on improvements. Um, the strategic or the uh, conference that we have now will roll out a strategic, a strategic agenda on October 2nd in the Volandic Building in Chicago. In that, we, have, uh, we are really doing what the Constitution said. We're going to study, we have studied where we are, where we need to go. We're adopting a mission statement to the core values of the court. Um, we've adopt, we're, we're going to uh, present four goal, five goals that the court has for the next three years, and then a number of initiatives as to how to handle it. I mean, it really gets into the work of the court, and we had we had four meetings with uh, this group, this group of 29, and we had almost 100 percent perfect attendance at all of the meetings, which is just it was outstanding. For 29 people, and, and I'm sure these are important people. They're, You're they're, not they're very grabbing busy. people off the street. Right. They're very uh, busy people. Yeah, that, I don't want to steal your thunder from the report coming out on October 2nd, but I probably will ask a number of questions that concern this conference, so it's a good uh, jumping off point in some of the other issues. When we spoke in the past, and also with Justice Kilbride when he was the chief, the funding of the courts was one of the problems that uh, 
as a third <clears throat> branch of government, you really, it seemed to me, were not funded properly. And we saw that, and you and I talked about that last time we sat, about how we're funded at the county level. And when you get into some of these counties around the state where they're just, uh, obviously, uh, the financial stability of each county is not equal. Uh, it seemed to me that, as a layman, we may have to rethink the the methodology of funding the courts and get away from solely at that county level and have some some more of a financial sharing of assets because I think there was a time when we had some of the courts in southern Illinois and you're a southern Illinois person uh, where they either couldn't or barely could afford to even pay a jury to sit in session and, no. and it's not like the jurors are getting big dollars you know no that's correct we have an un, uh, kind of an unusual structure on financing the court. Um, much of our budget, of course, comes for, through the General Assembly. And that's been a problem for, because our funding level was, um, was a level for five years. Uh, no increase, and in the meantime, there, there's uh, natural increases in costs. We have, a, we have a responsibility to fund part of the probation departments in all of the counties at a level of 100 percent. Last year we could only fund 60 percent of that. That meant the funding fell to the counties or if the counties didn't do it they cut probation officers. At the same time... So what happened to our probation services then? They were cut. And, and at the same time the legislature and we were cr uh, creating more duties for probation in pretrial services in uh, trying to uh, uh, determine which people should be released on less than a large bond uh, and we needed pretrial services to investigate their background. The legislature uh, also passed that but didn't, they didn't provide any funding. Now we did, we were successful this year in uh, getting uh, extra 60 million dollars that we needed last year and we need this year and it's being dedicated to 100 percent funding for the counties. Getting to that level, though, uh, took the efforts of my colleagues, the administrative office, people who are uh, assistant directors in probation. We had meetings with the uh, leaders of, of both parties in both ho the House and the Senate. We had a meeting with the governor, and we explained what we actually do. And it was uh, perhaps not surprising that many, uh, s uh, some of the legislatures did not understand the difference in funding between for parole officers and probation officers. Parole is funded by the Department of Corrections. They've always been adequately funded. Probation is funded through the Supreme Court. What, why is that? Should, should we move probation to the Department of Corrections? Or? Probably not because probation is really an arm of the court and it helps us determine or try to keep people out of the Department of Corrections. Parole is to try and people Release from, from prison. Right, they're yeah. released and hope there's no recidivism. But the other part of the problem you touched on is counties. Um, um, it, since we don't have complete funding from the state, it's kind of a hodgepodge. Which counties can afford it? And some of the larger counties can afford um, the adequate funding for the circuit clerk for probation at all. Many counties cannot, though, even to the point of paying jurors their 5 10 or $15 per day. And one of the things the Judicial Conference may look at, it's not the immediate agenda, but one of the goals is adequate funding and how we attain that. So that's one of the things I, I would expect over the next three years that conference will uh, consider. And that was kind of what I was going to go. So, when we, you know, so many times as a layman we hear, well, there's a commission studying something and well, whatever comes of that, you know. <laughs> Hopefully this conference will result in action items being addressed uh, because that's the thing that I often find when I, in my job, when I talk to people and I, I often say they're jaw-dropping moments. We sit, we the public, don't look under the hood. <laughs> and when you get a glimpse under the hood any number of times, you find out that uh, the functions of government are often barely functioning. And it's like, my, my gosh, that's how we do things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? So hopefully there's, and again, this, is, this would be certainly a bipartisan kind of thing. Everyone wants court system. And the other thing I would say, and I, I mean for you to respond, I don't mean to pontificate here, but if I'm going to court, if I'm uh, being sued, if I'm a corporation or an individual, 
we, we want to have whatever the decision is, we want to have it resolved and let's move along with our lives. And I would think that this lack of funding is also uh, part and parcel of the dragging out of justice, you might say, and slowing down the judicial branch and its functioning. It can do that. Um, what, what we really had problems with was funding probation because we can't cut salaries for judges or individuals who are um, contractually employed, uh, so probation suffered. But with that, that did slow down because judges couldn't get probation reports in advance uh, for determining bail or no bail situation. They couldn't get the PSI pre-sentence pre investigations to enable them to uh, conduct the sentencing hearing. And I, I've said a number of times, and publicly, and even to legislatures, I think the one branch of government in Illinois that has continued to work the way it's supposed to is the judicial branch. We are uh, conscientious and sensitive <clears throat> to the fact that when people have a dispute and they want the court to resolve it, it should be done in a timely, expeditious, and least costly manner. We are being flooded now with single uh, uh, self-represented litigants. Um, in some you know, kinds of cases, up 60, 70, 80 percent wow. in courts. And that creates more work for the clerk and more work for the judges because uh, self-represented litigants don't know the rules or the procedures and so they have to have some help. Our uh, Access to Justice Commission, which is part of the administrative office, but it's a separate commission within that, they're designed to address those problems and they have come up with standardized forms for use by people who represent themselves. Um, they uh, have a court interpreter program. I think they do 33 languages now for interpreting um, non-English language so people can understand what's going on. And those are the kind of things we'll keep studying and working on. And, and, and doing something about it other than just study it and say there's the problem. Now funding may cause delays in getting everything done, but at least we've got some, we have this group that's looking at it intensively. Which is a question I was going to ask, and the answer is yes, because I was going to say we had the funding problem. Is anyone taking a look at the funding of the courts? And so you are taking a look at that, right. hopefully then. And you, you know, we don't want you to, you in the collective sense, to jump out and just do something willy-nilly. You want to have people look at it thoughtfully and say what's the best way and how can we shore up the funding of the court system so it can continue to function and not just, uh, you know, with band-aids on the, uh, on the system, so to speak. Uh, and we are limited, of course. We don't have the power of the purse. We can't assess taxes. We can't raise funds. It's up to the General Assembly. But it's our obligation, I think, to make sure that members of the General Assembly understand our obligations and their obligation to fund us fully. Right, and as I often say, people can't be for or against something or if they're unaware of the problem. So just raising the issue and educating people on the issue, in your case with the judicial branch, letting the legislator know, uh, I would guess they're all more or less open to it. Of course, there's always competing uh, demands on the monies that are available. They certainly do, but we did a couple of other things over the last couple of years. Uh, Justice Garman and I both appeared at the orientation session for the new legislatures um, last fall, I guess it was, or 2016, after they were elected. Um, we were invited to attend and we talked about the role of the court and the, uh, the role of the legislature in connection with funding. We have a law school for legislatures and uh, to their credit, the, the leaders of the party of, of the houses and the uh, Senate have came and brought new uh, legislators and others with them. Very well received. Um, but it, it, it's, um, I think the court, maybe in the past, did not become proactive in making sure the legislature understood what we did and how we, how we were dependent upon them and why, although a governor or a Senator would say, well, everybody else is taking a cut. You have to take a 10% cut. Well, when we were at level funding for five years, we were being cut. When you, uh, your term as the Chief Justice uh, bridged <clears throat> the transformation or transition, I should say, from Governor Rauner to Governor Pritzker. Uh, as we tape this, Governor Pritzker has been in office about 
nine months or so. How badly, uh, if at all, were, was the Illinois court system damaged by the lack of budgets being passed or not passed by the legislature? There was always a concern, of course, the, uh, uh, that, that we would have funding. And the, the, the uh, legislature, I guess, and the comptroller was under orders from the court to pay certain things. And, but it, it was uh, not a continuing thing. We, had to be, we always had to be concerned about it. It was a very rough time when there was no budget. We couldn't rely on anything. We, we, we did get the, the shortfall funding, the same amount that we had in previous years. Because there was no budget, that was basically all that the, uh, I guess, the controller and the treasurer, whoever, you know, we, we direct the controller to pay out these funds. Uh, that was the guideline. You and I uh, talked last time about the, uh, you know, typically, I think over the years, and maybe reinforced by us watching old movies, and we still think that's how it was from Spencer Tracy being on the court or something. But technology is changing every field. I now can do TV interviews over the internet. I recently interviewed someone in France. Uh, has anyone speaking of the funding of the courts said, maybe we ought to embrace the technology in an application so that perhaps we could have a judge in Sangamon County hearing a case in Williamson County or Johnson County or Hardin County? Uh, and, and that would make it more affordable and we could speed along some of these cases where one county has more assets and down there they're hard pressed. Uh, that, that is not only under consideration, but there is, uh, we approved a pilot pot, uh, project for online dispute resolution for self-represented litigants. Um, that'll start November 1. Um, we we'll want to see how that works. We have some, How long of a pilot would that be? We expect it to be one year, and uh, it's, it's very detailed in, in what the, the type of people can come in, who can use it. Um, I go to the Conference of Chief Justices of, from, all of, from all of the states, and it's a big item of discussion, online dispute resolution, how that's going to work, that the court needs to be involved in it because ultimately whatever the parties may come to as an agreement has to be approved by the court and then eventually enforced by the court. Some counties are using uh, TV arraignments to uh, cut down on having to bring prisoners from the jail to another location, right. which uh, involves cost and uh, safety issues. Those are things that, and, uh, that we think we should be doing more of. There are some judges who um, are very active in, in uh, hearing motions by telephone conference call. It alleviates the need for a lawyer to travel an hour or two to a courthouse in southern Illinois or elsewhere and, uh, and have to charge a client for that. But it is it's, it's clearly uh, it's, it's on our horizon. We've just completed getting all of the counties in the state um, online for e-filing, electronic filing, with the addition of DuPage County. Um, I know those are all in the civil cases and all of the appellate court districts and the Supreme Court is using e-filing, which helps people get the cases before us. But the next aspect of it, will we ever have televised arguments where we just have a, a lawyer on a TV screen here arguing to us? I don't know if that'll go that far. But in, well, but we in, can have the Illinois Channel do <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but in trial courts, there's so many um, calls, you know, for just the status of the case that may take five minutes and you know why not do that either by uh, teleconference uh, computers now I guess probably the obviously little... help the legal I mean just profession at large right. not just the courts but the law firms etc cetera, etc cetera. Can, can't you just put a little camera on top of your uh, TV screen Skype with each other yeah. yes I don't do that but I know that's available those are things that uh, the, the uh, judicial conference will be looking at uh, well, you know, and, and I would just say, uh, as, a, as a citizen, it's good to hear that because, you know, you sometimes wonder, are people looking at, now that we're in this world, uh, how, how should we be reflecting the technology and integrating that, not in a way that, that would distort, you have to take a careful look, distort the, the process and interfere with justice, but to expedite it and, and add to it and do more with less, uh, which is, I think, the overall point of technology. Um, in 1998, I had to 
uh, leave my work to go down to the Sangamon County Courthouse to get a legal document. And I thought, what, you couldn't have a PDF where I can just print it out, you know? So yeah. now I'm sure they do that. And right. it, that's one small example. But when you have to, in, you know, just not too long ago, we were driving down to pick up documents that now we can, so. Um, let me, uh, I'll apologize ahead of time if we get into things you can't answer, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to look, as we sit here and we talk about funding, and obviously the big bugaboo is pensions in the state. Now, not going forward, but let me look back. I thought it was interesting looking back from the 2015 decision by the Illinois Supreme Court uh, that you had a decision, and in the decision, and it was characterized as a crisis, which I think most people would say it, it is. Uh, the court said uh, that, uh, that they have to uphold the rule of law. I'm paraphrasing here. This is true at all times. This is especially true in important times of crisis when, as the case demonstrates, even clear principles of long-standing precedent are threatened. Crisis is not an excuse to abandon the rule of law. It is a summons to defend it. So one question would be, with the ruling that you had in 2015, and I think before you had another in 2013, are we done with the pension issue relative to the courts? Is that going to be the standing law? People are saying, we just, the Illinois Channel, carried a panel discussion from the city club on what can we do about the pensions? It's killing <clears throat> the city of Chicago, it's choking the state, and everyone short of passing and changing the constitution, is there, is there any wiggle room? Or I, I guess I'm asking on behalf of all those trying to think, what can we do that isn't going to be thrown out for being unconstitutional? Of course, what the legislature has already done as far as state employees and judges is concerned is adopted a different method for the tier two employees since January of 2011, I believe it right, was. Right, I think that's right. And you know, someone on my court just said that I think over half the judges in Illinois are now tier two. So in a couple of generations. Interesting. Yeah, you know, in, in, in another generation or so, the, the pension benefits for tier two uh, judges, I know, and I think for all employees is substantially less. Uh, it seems to me that the legislature back in the time when they allowed these uh, very generous pensions for all employees really were not thinking very far ahead. And uh, when they adopted the proposed changes that we said were, as you quoted from Kenerva, um, they realized that it was probably not constitutional. Some mm -hmm. of the lawyers um, express that doubt. They were trying to find the wiggle room then. They were, and, and they, they were saying... It's like you know, sticking a threading a needle yeah. legally, right? It's, it's, it's a different time, so, you know, we've got to apply the law differently. Well, the Constitution is constant, and we pointed out in, in that um, um, opinion that the states of Kentucky, Indiana, and Missouri um, all had fairly fully funded pensions. The problem with Illinois was the legislature wasn't funding what they had committed themselves to doing. Let me ask, and again, I'm going to go into a line of question that you may want to dodge, but uh, I'll ask him anyway, and you can dodge it if you wish. Okay. One of the interesting things, there's a number of interesting things, but one of them is, uh, speaking of times of crisis right now, one of the things is gun violence. and I, So we're speaking generically. I'm not going to ask you specifically <laughs> about a case. But we witness not only in Illinois, but just in other places around the country, this sanctuary cities where some people say, we're not going to participate in whatever. Uh, might be immigration, you know, was often a sanctuary city. In some cases, it's being now applied to the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. We have the city of Chicago taking one stand. We have some counties where the sheriffs are saying, well, if you do that, we're not going to participate. And it seems to me we're, we're, we've never had this as I was growing up, to where we all of a sudden have people, uh, elected officials, uh, thinking they can opt out of the rule of law. We just said the court says, even in times of crisis, you have to follow the rule of law. And it would seem to me if we don't, then what's the point of a legislature if you can just change it willy-nilly? Philosophically, can you address that without, you know, touching on any specific issues? 
I can understand because there, uh, some of these are very emotional issues. Second Amendment rights certainly are people who uh, believe that there is no, uh, no restrictions on that right as opposed to those who believe reasonable restrictions. But um, you, you gave the answer, follow the rule of law, whatever that is. That's our obligation. As we interpret the federal and the Illinois Constitution, when the federal Constitution is interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court, we have to follow that. The, the Illinois Constitution is within our bailiwick. And that brings me to a similar question, but a kind of interesting. The other thing is you're the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court until October 26, I believe, Correct. when Justice Burke will become the new chief. Uh, but a, a, as you overlook the uh, court system in Illinois, you're also under the auspices of the federal constitution. So you interpret the Illinois constitution. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court would interpret the application of law under the federal constitution. As we now sit here recently, we're just in the spring session of the legislature, they passed a bill that was, says uh, come January, we're going to have legalized recreational use of marijuana in Illinois. So then the question is, as a justice on the Supreme Court, which law do you follow? The U.S. Constitution, which is supposed to have predominance over the lower courts, the Supreme Court of Illinois being a lower court, or do you follow the Illinois law that says, hey, it's okay to uh, smoke marijuana in your house? Colorado has been de uh, dealing with this for a couple of years now. Uh, they have the same, you know, they legalized it a few years ago. It creates not only a question, the question you raise, but a kind of an ethical question for lawyers. Can, what can they do in representing um, concerns that want to open a shop or want to grow, knowing that uh, they may be violating the federal laws? I think there are duties that lawyers have to tell them the uh, uh, problems that may arise if you, uh, if you smoke, whatever you do. But I think the federal government, at least in Colorado, has taken kind of a hands-off approach to the problem. And, but it is, it's a dichotomy. Um, both laws apply to us. And people may be violating federal laws. Um, so when we get to the question of enforcing the rule of law, it, it becomes some, it's not the only time it becomes vague. I would say the rule of law is not always clear cut, right? That's correct. And it's, you know, it, and sometimes it's, we like to think of stare decisis as giving us a firm uh, precedent on which to build, but um, interpretations do change over the years. But this problem, um, if it comes to the courts, now of course that's going to be up to the state prosecutors if they want to prosecute alleging violence, or the federal prosecutors want to prosecute under the federal laws. I don't think we'll have state prosecutors bringing anything under the federal statutes if they could. So whether, whether we get that case or uh, that type of case or not is problematic, but I wouldn't comment on what happens when we get it. Well, it's, it's fascinating just to think as we stand back and take the big picture view of the changing of the law that you're operating in this time of technical transition and this transition as we just spoke about, I mean, where we're going from don't use marijuana to use marijuana. But I guess that's always been somewhat the case. A hundred years ago, they didn't have laws on automobiles, and they had to come up with a whole set of laws regulating use of automobiles, which had never existed before. Right. We're getting into areas with the Internet of what does it mean to privacy? What is the right to privacy? Can I fly a drone in the backyard of Lord Cormier and see uh, who's, who's at his party. And then we find out, well, there's no right to privacy. You don't control the airspace of your backyard. And that maybe we have to come up with that and pass a law by the legislature. So it's fascinating. And, and we're getting some of those questions uh, in connection with, uh, with the drones that you mentioned. Um, but it's, it's going to be uh, our duty to interpret what we have based upon existing laws. And we do sometimes say in our opinions, uh, if, if uh, one party or the other is requesting, requesting that we make a policy decision or policy change, that that's a function of the legislature. And we, uh, we would suggest the legislature take a look at that. 
I don't want to, as time grows short, uh, I may be asking too big of a question, but uh, I'll try it anyway. Uh, in Illinois, as compared to other states, and it varies by the states, Illinois elects judges. Um, I grew up in Missouri where they're appointed. It's more like the federal. Uh, the issue is, then we get into, um, one, is it a good thing to elect judges, I suppose, you know. Uh, and, and I guess for the voters, and we go back again, the first time we did an interview was when you were running. Um, I couldn't ask you, it's almost like the, uh, the U.S. Senate when someone is going to the U.S. Supreme Court, they can't ask specifically about a case. So it's more of a philosophical discussion. But how can voters decide if they want Judge A versus Candidate B uh, when we can't ask them, how would you decide on the pension bill? How would you decide on gun bills and all that? Uh, should we have elected judges given the limitations of the system? or? Or would you, have you ever given any thought to maybe we should think about going to an appointed system? I have given thought to that, and especially after my election, which, as you recall, was rather, uh, rather costly. Um, I think it set a record, didn't it? At the time it was, mm -hmm. yes. And it stood for quite a while, I believe, but it's been broken. Um, shortly after that, the, uh, I think it was the Brennan Institute, uh, sponsored a survey um, in, I think it was only in the 5th District where I ran from, asking about, you know, what they felt about the money being spent, the ads that were on, that type of thing, and nobody liked any of that. But the final question was, would you prefer appointing or electing judges? And I think, I think if I'm right, about 85% said elect. So people want the opportunity to do that. The constraints that a candidate has are, as you mentioned, we can't say how we vote on issues. People have to look at my character, my personality, what I've done, uh, the uh, reputation I've had as a, a circuit judge or as a lawyer or whatever it is. You mentioned Missouri. What's interesting to me about Missouri is only the Supreme Court and the appellate courts have that system other than in, I think, St. Louis, no, not even St. Louis County, but uh, wherever Springfield is. I can't remember that uh, county. I forget the name of the county. Green, maybe? I don't yeah, forget. but other judges have to run every four years on a contested ballot, the, the trial judges. So they have a very modified system. Uh, the problem, and, and I was on a couple of panels in Missouri right after my election because people knew what went on and they were going to contrast our system with theirs and how much better it was. And, and I got the question, why don't you have this system in Illinois? And I said, well, let's see. Uh, uh, if you have the governor appointed, Governor Kerner went to prison, Governor Ryan went to prison, Judge <laughs> Bogoyevich went to prison, and Judge uh, Walker went to prison. Do you want those people appointing judges? Uh, and tell me that it's merit. You know, it's not merit. The U.S. system has gotten away from merit. It's become completely partisan. Mm -hmm as the Kavanaugh hearing would show. So unless we get back to a system where it's truly um, a merit, or get to a system, um, I've, I've come around to the point that elected is not as bad as I thought it was right after my election. Some people look at the Illinois Supreme Court and go, well, of course they voted that way. They voted along party lines, which is, I hate to think of people looking at judges at party lines. I believe you said in a previous interview, though, in your deliberations, that it's not partisan. It's it's you're you're all just looking at it from a legal standpoint. Unfortunately, sometimes the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin will, when a when a decision happens along party lines, or even sometimes other, will say they were elected as a Democrat as a Republican, and right. it fosters this belief. But if you look at the voting patterns, and there's a law firm in Chicago that has, that has done this in minute detail. It's amazing. Uh, where our votes line up with each other, and, and uh, more often than not, well, it's very rarely along party lines where it's a 4-3 split. I know you have to go somewhere, so we're going to have to let you go right away, but uh, what's the future for Justice Carmeier? Are you going to stay in the court? Are you, do you, have you thought about uh, trying to run again? Or You've had a long, distinguished career. I think you began, what, as a lawyer around 1964 or so? 1964, clerking for the Supreme Court. Uh, well, congratulations so far on a wonderful <laughs> yeah. career. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let me just say, I guess what, if you want to comment on that, uh, do you, have you decided well, for the future? Um, you know, when I was elected to the Supreme Court, I was uh, in my 60s, mid-60s almost, and I promised the uh, 
electorate that I would serve that term. And when it got to uh, time to consider retention, my wife and I talked about it, and she didn't think it was a real good idea, but I said, oh, this is the easy election. Well, it turned out it wasn't. <laughs> it was nastier than the first. Um, I won't run again, um, considering my age. I, I will, after I step down as the chief, and during this process, I will be making a decision as to whether I will, will finish my term, which would be in 2024, or allow someone younger. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, 79 years old. You're a young 79-year-old. <laughs> And if I stay, I'd be 84 when the term ends. And I don't want to be on the court when there's someone might question whether or not uh, I'm as strong as or as uh, alert or able to do the job. Um, I'd rather go out when I think I'm still at the top of my game. Chief Justice Lloyd Carmar, uh, we always appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, and we wish you well for whatever the future holds for you. Thank you for your service on the, to the state of Illinois and the court, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for your gracious interview. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.